Welcome to the Escrima Podcast. My name is Jason Enai. I'm an Enai and Escrimador. So it's uh, Wednesday, uh, October 4th, and uh, we had a great class last night focused mostly on Serada and um, development. Really talked about how the curriculum is designed in a certain way, whereas to be able to create results really fast. Uh, uh, I'm wondering, you know, how everyone else uh, views training and curriculum. You know, there's so many different ways, like as I spoke about in the previous podcast about testing, right? Is, you know, like what's your criteria for a test and things like that. In the same sense, what's what's your process for teaching and what's your end result, right? Like, you know, we want to make sure that someone can defend themselves as fast as possible. And my father's, it really comes from my father's, like, I don't know if it's a stipulation or, or in any sense, an intent that he wanted people that practice the United system of Eskrima to, as quickly as possible, become proficient enough to defend themselves against a typical kind of attack, right? And, you know, I noticed that students frequently have a lot of things going on in their lives here in the modern world in the West here, uh, here in the U.S., here in the Bay Area, California, right? And that it doesn't serve the individual practitioner if the curriculum is designed in such a way as to uh, unnecessarily elongate the amount of training that is required or needed to progress, right? So, I've also realized with certain students that there's a, a great many life experiences that they come with uh, as adults, because mostly I teach adults, but even as teenagers that I can leverage because their bodies have, have already done a lot of the movements that we're looking for, just not in that sequence, not for that reason, right? Or maybe not in that long of a sequence of movements, right? Especially if anybody's done a little bit of sports, right? Or anything, even, even to a degree dance, then they've learned body control and things like that, right? So if those things are, are the case and I'm working under those conditions, right? How do I get out of the way of their learning process in order to see them progress as quickly as possible first to being able to defend themselves and then becoming a, you know, a recognizable FMA practitioner, Filipino martial arts practitioner. Not that they are recognizable themselves. That may or may not be the case. Really that when someone's seeing them do martial arts, they say, well, what kind of martial arts is that if they've never seen uh, Filipino martial arts or that must be Filipino martial arts. That's not actually ha well, how it happens. Most people's subjective experiences make them fill in the blanks when they don't know something with something else. Or because if they know something more, they'll say it's that. You know, I've, I've done Filipino martial arts for most of my life, uh, going on uh, 46 years. And uh, I've noticed that, you know, if they're long time... Uh, Japanese martial arts uh, practitioner, I'll do a move the, and they'll relate to their Japanese martial arts. I've actually had uh, a master of uh, Chinese martial arts say, oh, you must be doing this kind of Chinese martial arts. And that means two things to me, right? One is, is that there's a lot of similarities, right? And people are going to see what they find similar and that's okay. And the other part of it is that person's subjective experience of, you know, they believe what they're doing is right and good and that's great, right? And anything that they feel is looking correct to them, effective to them, they're going to relate it to that because we frequently can only perceive what we already know uh, and it's difficult to um, go past that, right? To go beyond that. So, 
I had a great Serata class last time. <clears throat> and I'm explaining to one of the returning instructors, uh, this gentleman had been uh, an instructor under my father and had not trained in probably 30 years, right? Uh, not consistently anyways. So while a lot of that muscle memory or that memory of what's supposed to be done is there, it's a perishable skill. And, <clears throat> you know, there is, there's uh, some knocking off the rust, if you will, to be done. And then of course, everyone can improve. I want to improve, all my students want to improve, right? And I'm explaining to him, you know, how, how quickly we want, to, we want to teach. And not quickly, how quickly we want to see a ramp up of skill in the students and how we develop that. And, you know, working through that with the students uh, last night was really fun. Uh, mostly working on Serada as a medium to close range, uh, so that that was that was quite fun, difficult because I have uh, 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 an injury of tendonitis in my left ankle. So, um, you know, trying to perform as best as possible under those conditions. Right? Uh, the thing I, I think about or reflect upon this morning is whether that's successful or not. Right? Whether that rapid skill development, rapid uh, start, if you will, to the training, to the people's ability, is, is, is it effective? Is it working? And it does if you're, you're not looking for some kind of perfection soon, right? And it does if... You, you, you've taken a long time to uh, reflect upon, analyze, study uh, material that informs you of what like a real fight might be like, right? Uh, if you've, you know, possibly been involved in enough fights yourself, right? If you have enough of it, uh, background information, experience, right? This, this, from this perspective, right? I want someone to be able to defend themselves. I don't really care how good it looks. If they can prevent me from applying my fist to their face or applying my stick to their head or preventing me from punching them in the chest or kicking them in the leg or striking them with a stick or a knife at any portion of their body, if they can prevent that reasonably well, meaning that most of the time under uh, duress, they're reasonably successful or at least mitigate a withering attack, then I, I've reached that first milestone. And then from there, you know, we want to polish that up. We want the positions to be better, the elbows to be in tight if that's what's required, right? Uh, good geometry, good physics in their defenses. So uh, the geometry needs to be really good, both for physics and so in order to support a, a, a strong block and defend a, a powerful blow. But also the geometry needs to be right so that way they're not out of position. If we shape our bodies widely and awkwardly, we're always gonna be slow. We might think we're gonna be fast, but when we review that footage on video, right? If we review the video after, we see, yeah, that was quick, not that fast, right? And if we continue to use the lens of, can we do this harder? Can we do this faster? Can we do this more randomly, less choreography? Can we do this under increasingly difficult circumstances? The same thing we might have learned in the first month, six months, year of training, but we're doing it with greater intensity, greater sophistication, greater complexity, right? Then we use that more to determine whether the technique is you know, correct, right? We can pantomime the movement, but unless we stress it, we're uncertain. Or you should be uncertain anyways, because you haven't tested it, right? So, last night we went through the very, very standard thing. This is this comes from Grandmaster Kabbalah, sorry. Learn a technique. And there's a bunch of different ways to teach a technique, right? Uh, then, uh, 
put it under stress of random attack, right? Can you put your defenses together, right? And then do a give and take, right? You can call it sombrada, you can call it flow spar, you can call it whatever you want, right? But it's a give and take, turn taking, if you will. But the idea is, can you put counterattack together with your defense? So you defend in some way against some line of attack, and then you immediately fire back an attack. Can you strike, attack, and recover to defend easily? So you, you go through this process, right? Uh, then, then the question has to be asked, right? Can you do more than the, just those two or three defenses that you keep doing? Because that ain't that great, right? If you're always doing the same defense against the same line or maybe the same two defenses against the same line, meh, right? If you're doing it in a pattern, meh, right? Uh, are, can you return a different attack off the same line that you defended with the same defense, with a different defense? Are you returning the same lines all the time? Because if you are, meh, right? Serada, the, the way that the training is, looks, if we look at a crush, and what I mean by a crush is, is that two opponents, and let's just say because for ease of, of training and argument that it's just two people squared up, right? Because that's also not necessarily how fights work, right? But uh, two people, they're aware of each other, they see each other, there's no surprise, there's no, you know, whatever, deception or whatever. And uh, they come in to attack. Frequently what we see is a crush, a crush, what I mean by that is they are out of range and then they move into range and then they continue to press to maybe too close. This is very common when we see people that haven't fought very much, at least in my uh, training and my observation by watching and participating in a lot of things during my security work and things like that. And so we see these people that, that they're willing to aggress uh, they're willing to aggress back, right? And they uh, ha perhaps have a couple tricks up their sleeves. This is somebody that's dangerous because they can hit you and it, and, and it can hurt you and it could be something very serious, right? Not necessarily very skilled, but very willing, right? So we see in that a crush. And this, this habit of, of, of pressing or crushing doesn't necessarily go away in the first year of training, in the first two years of training. And if we do a lot of technique work and we do a lot of choreographed drill work, right? We'll see it in someone that's been training a lot, but they've only exclusively been doing techniques and forms and drills. No reflex training, no sparring. And by sparring, I mean actual sparring, not a give and take kind of flow spar which we see in a lot of Serata groups, but actually like, all right, helmet, no helmet, glove, no glove. I'm gonna hit you, you're gonna hit me, it's random, there's no turn taking, right? It's it's a, it's closer to a fight, right? It's probably, the only thing you might be missing is intensity and malice, right? So we, we see this press, right? And Serata's job is to control or get to the position or the, the proximity of a, of a press and then control it. You're not too close, you're not too far. You're able to inhibit your opponent's ability to attack and defend while remaining free to attack. Right? And that's essentially its strategy other than trying to maintain the center line or occupy the center line, right? So when we see this and we use that as a lens to judge our serrada, right? We start seeing places we can improve, right? So the process of teaching of like, making you good enough to be able to defend yourself. Okay, now it looks like Philippine martial arts. Now, that looks like you might be training under Mike and I's lineage, right? That's kind of the, the goal, right? That there's a, some indication of a particular standard of ability and movement, right? So you're moving in, you're doing your thing, right? And, uh, you guys get too close. Now, if that was the goal and there's a result ending there that leaves you in a tactically superior, strategically superior position, 
yeah, that's awesome. If, on the other hand, it becomes a stalemate and you don't break the stalemate, uh, not awesome, right? And so we go back to the drum. Work your basics, you work your drills, maybe you encounter a problem and you keep encountering the same problem and you address that through your techniques and your drills and then you go back and you test through your reflux and flow training. And this is this process that Grandmaster Kabbalah's uh, had from the very beginning and through his association with my father, refined it down so that you could learn uh, smaller chunks of the material and more quickly deploy or rapidly uh, excel in the curriculum, right? Learning, you know, more than a handful of techniques per, you know, for any given line of attack becomes uh, less useful if they're not surfacing under stress, right? right? Whether it's spontaneous behavioral re-immersion, right? Look that up. Or it's something that, you know, you're deliberately doing or that you're doing something out of rote, right? Uh, for the lack of a better term. So, you know, there's a difference between reaction and response. I can react to something, but frequently when we use the term reaction, it's like, oh, no, no, I just reacted, meaning I didn't have a choice. Uh, response, on the other hand, uh, is a choice. Reflexive response means that you either prepared the movement or had a brief opportunity within that moment to decide between one, two, or three, or four other techniques, right? Uh, you should know more than three or four techniques per any given line of attack. You should know, in the United System of Security, I should actually have at least three or four different strategic responses. Now, I could be doing Largo Mono, and it could be the Cinco Terros method, uh, a floating step, more uh, Innocento Kali kind of method. It could be uh, more of a Luzon, Paiete, Laguna method of Largo Mono, which I'll all have the same idea of, of eluding an attack and then counterattacking simultaneously or near simultaneously, right? Could be with defang the snake or not defang the snake, whatever it is. But that is a whole strategic response to a problem presented by an opponent, which is I'm going to elude that attack and counterattack nearly simultaneously and remain in a position where the opponent's going to have to expose themselves while I'm not quite in range or quickly moving just out of range as they launch each initial attack and each succeeding attack, I continue to create that space for them to expand into and expose themselves, right? That's one strategic response. Right. Another strategic response might be that I'm a double stick player. I'm a, I do Sarada, I do Makababy, whatever, right? And, or not, excuse me, Sinawali and Makababy. And the person comes and I use my two tools to overwhelm their attack and quickly counterattack using, uh, you know, uh, varied strikes at different parts of the body, defigging the snake, whilst changing my position, right? So that the person is, I'm never directly in front of the person, right? That's a different strategic response. And the tactics themselves, the techniques that we learn, are the small ways that we initiate and execute that strategy. So for Sarada, right, it's, it's stay in the center line, it's inhibit, right? And then in Serrada, you'll have three, four, 12, 27 different responses to the same line, right? Now it's a question of where was I relative to my opponent when they launched that attack and what specific objective am I trying to achieve, right? Do I want to take the leg? Do I want to take the arm? Do I want to take the head? Do I want to take the off hand? Uh, am I going to employ more of my live hand, right? And to what end? Am I gonna do that in? And this is that process of, I can defend myself. Uh, that looks like a screamer. Oh, that looks like an iron system of a screamer. Oh, that looks like something that's being done very deliberately. You know, I watched my father fight once, more than once, but I'm just thinking of a particular occasion. And he used a form of 
Cinewale is the only way that I could put it. He wasn't close enough to engage with his live hand, right? And there is a form of serrada where you don't, right? So there's a gray area there. So there's a form of serrada where I don't need my live hand, right? And it has to do mostly with range and distance, right? But I'll, I'll say it's Cinewale. It was a redondo movement for the most part. And he was using an upward figure eight or a downward figure eight in the middle of it as a constant movement component. And uh, he, he very strategically took this person's ability to move away in a handful of shots, maybe three, maybe four shots, hit the leg in a very specific way, made the leg fail. The person falls over, right? Uh, he, was, he was controlling distance the whole time as the person advanced. Right, he would do that when he attacked, he would advance, which would cause the other person to retreat, so on and so forth. But while there looks like there's this give and take dance, what I noticed is that the distance was near nearly constant, right? So, this near constant distance while the person is attacking two or three different lines at any one given time, right? In succession, in combo, and singularly, right? And he's still clipping the same leg through that process, right? It was a very strategic tactical process that he went through that was deliberate right and so we see this as a as first wow that's awesome second like okay so this is the progenitor of our system and this is the press precedent with which we need to follow through with right and so going back to the Serata class this uh, last evening right uh, we start off with some hit and evade and then we move into some basic blocking drills I always do this you know, we use the core of this, which is re reinforced blocking for us and make sure everybody can defend themselves because uh, I don't also believe that you should be ready to do a reflex drill, which we call lock and block, right? I don't, I don't believe I should wait till you're ready. I should be able to get you to the point where you can basically defend yourself and you can break the drill. So you can use your course blocking. That's not Serata. That's breaking the drill, right? You can use dodging or larger mono to get out of the way because you don't have any preparation and break the drill, but you won't be considered being successful, but you are defending yourself, right? And that's ultimately the goal. I always remind my students that we are not here to be good at any given technique or drill or style. First and foremost, we're here to be able to prevent people from doing harm upon us and to be able to issue back harm with impunity. So if that's the case, I don't wait till they're ready. So we work on uh, some invasion drills, we work on some basic blocking, and then we move into the Sonata, right? And each of the students, uh, you know, and as I was reviewing the footage uh, that we took that evening of that and their responses and how they did, and you can see, you know, uh, Patrick specifically uh, performed extremely well, right? Hitting him harder and faster than I hit uh, anybody else that evening. And, and, you know, only like my most senior students can take that kind of withering attack, right? So what we're trying to do is get them to be able to control this one space, make it so that they can defend themselves, uh, be able to use Serada's ability to inhibit by making sure that they're using their live hand to check and trap, right? And the first step is to be able to make contact. If you're not approximating the correct distance or footwork, you will not be able to employ Serada to any real notable level, right? If we look at it from the point of view of movement signature, who's our standard? Well, our standard is Grandmaster Andrew Wallace. We have to approximate that movement to do Serada because he's the one that defines Serada, right? And we have to do it in such a way as that we're creating advantage. It is uh, my assertion that martial arts is uh, the, the art of conflict, risk, and advantage. During the conflict, you calculate a risk to achieve an advantage. The main advantage that Serada uh, tries to employ is the utilization of the live or left hand in order to inhibit the opponent's ability to defend an attack. We see the same thing in Balinta Walk. And the way that Balinta Walk does it is they do uh, stick on stick or reinforced blocking, uh, right? Where their hand is leveraging their stick on a second point, leverage point, in order to uh, create a, a more stable blocking surface, right? And then an immediate inhibition, usually a grabbing of the stick, right? 
and that creates that advantage because now the person who's who you're you're sparring against or in that case they're doing their patterns with right their their weapon is inhibited they, they can't freely move right so that creates a delay in their timing which then allows for an opening to an attack and i only need one opening because if i have a a decent enough stunning attack not a finishing attack but a stunning and interrupting attack I can buy two more movements and those two will buy five more right so uh, we see this in, in Blood to Walk and we see this in other styles that employ the live hand similarly right so feeding with these guys uh, lock and block and then doing close bar we see who's uh, got better geometry right so and that's really going to be not necessarily aesthetics, but you know the reality is, is that if you're very good, you will be good at the techniques, and you will be good at the drills because the techniques and drills already show a refined form of movement that allows you to have quicker returns and quicker recoveries. The, the moments when you're not moving or you're not doing something that would be defined as an attack or a defense, but a recovery from, right? So you see who's able to employ the proper geometry so their recovers are better and who can maintain distance well enough without having to back up all the time because that's not Serata, right? And who's able to deliver more varied attacks and perform more varied defensive maneuvers whilst still maintaining the correct proximity. And this, this process that I'm talking about we do with all the styles within the United System of the Screen, which just happened to be a Serata night, right? So we're working on employing the right movement, the right proximity, and the correct strategies in that movement and pro proximity or relational space, if you will, right? Like what zone am I in? How close am I? And then in which, in what way am I employing my hands and my and my sides, my stick side or sword side, and my my shield or empty hand side, right? How am I employing them? Those things I can look at those things and say, okay, I know what this style is that this person is doing. In this case, I should be seeing Serata because we were practicing Serata. And you know, some of them, some of them used a little bit of Largamano in the sense that they were backing up a lot. Not ideal. But if we're talking about being able to defend yourself. As far as the stages of development are concerned, successful. Um, are they uh, are they correctly placing their hands and their stick in a way where they're uh, in a better position each time, which would be more recognizably Filipino martial arts or at least just good martial arts? And uh, are they doing it in a way that uh, is consistent with the teaching methods that we do in the United System of Scriba, which means uh, a keener eye on uh, geometry in terms of footwork, in terms of hand placement, in terms of supporting angles. Uh, and, uh, and that's usually defined by how you angle your foot and your arm together in a way to create good supporting lines against an attack, right? Also, without overly exposing yourself. Every time we lift our elbows up, which is bad, generally speaking, um, we expose the midriff and we actually uh, eliminate uh, a part of our musculature. Like if, if you're if you're doing a push-up, right, and you do a diamond push-up or tricep push-up, right, so you make that diamond in your hand and you put that on there and you'll notice that your elbows are in towards your ribs a little bit more, right? That as you do that, you activate your triceps, but you also activate your pec muscles, your chest muscles, right? Now, if we take that same hand, you know, placement, if you will, and then we splay out the elbows so that we wing them out, and then we attempt to do that, we eliminate the, the, the chest from the, the movement. So now I'm only relying or more more relying on my triceps to do the same work and I'm eliminating the ability to fully use my chest to do that pushing and movement. So we look at that geometry when we're when they're training and, and that's the thing that I'm looking for, right? Because like if I see that you widen out your arms, you're gonna be slower and you're gonna be weaker. So what I can do is I can exploit that. I can exploit that movement without changing my proximity or anything else. I can just take tighter lines. Instead of coming out on a wide attack, I come in a narrower, withering attack, moving straighter in and pressing towards your center line, and your blocks will fail, not because 
you don't have your hands in the right place or you didn't get your stick in the way, but because you just, your, mu your musculature can't support that. Now you could pop it. Some people, they like to push real hard or like do a little bit of a popping movement when they do their fence, in which case I change the timing of my strike, but I keep the same tight angles. And what that happens is that you overexpose yourself in your defense and then I can exploit that as well. And so we use this process that I've been kind of talking through to, you know, incrementally improve the ability of my opponent or my student, I should say. You know, my objective in, in being so specific in the way that I teach is I want every person that I come into contact with, especially if they give me devo devotion and time and discipline in the training, that they are so well in their defense that I cannot penetrate their defense with the standard average kind of attack from our point of view. And I want my students' ability to defend themselves to be such that they're impregnable. impregnable. And then I want their attacks to be so clean and so well-placed that they're irresistible. So it was a great class. See you on the training floor.